Okay, our next is our carbon pricing keynote. Dale Begay, Executive Director of Canada's Ecofiscal Commission. Dale is the Ecofiscal's lead policy wonk. He moves comfortably from being big picture strategy to quantitative analytic, uh, analytics. I almost said it French wise, eh? In French, we have a difficulty with certain words, like home economics. So I'll begin from the beginning, sorry about that. Dale is Ecofiscal's lead policy wonk. He moves comfortably from big picture strategy to quantitative analytic. analytics. <laughs> he has deep expertise and experience in environmental economics and policy, and in particular, carbon pricing. He has consulted for governments and organizations across Canada and internationally. He's also worked as a policy advisor with the National Roundtable on the Environment and the Economy. Uh, Dale holds a master's degree in resource environmental management from Simon Fraser University with a specialization in energy econ economy modeling. Dale Begay. It's Bugin, even though it's spelled Begay for me in French. Okay. <laughs> it was French long ago and then moved to southern Alberta and became Bugin. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Great to be here. I'm going to keep my water close. Okay. Who's heard of Canada's Ecofiscal Commission? Anybody? Oh, all of you have. Wow. Best crowd ever. <laughs> well, I guess I'm done then. So, so look, we're, we're a group of economists. My commissioners are our top economists from across the country, and they're backed up by an advisory board of high-profile politicians from across the spectrum, from industry, from, from environmental groups. I mean, really, our mandate is to identify and analyze and promote policies that make sense for both the environment and for the economy. And over the last five years, we've spent rather a lot of time talking about carbon pricing and making the case for carbon pricing. And it's gone up. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And, and look, it's, it's, been, it's been a tough slog at times, especially the last year or so. And as opposition starts to mobilize and has mobilized, it's become really important for us to start to engage more directly in that conversation and that debate and to rebut some of these pervasive and pernicious myths about carbon pricing that are kind of used consistently, consistently again and again as talking points in, in opposition to carbon pricing. So today I'm gonna to do six carbon pricing myths, but also how to overcome those myths. And since you all know the Equal Fiscal Commission is a group of economists, we're very geeky, we're very, very data oriented. I will sure enough stay true to character and equip you with some data and some economics and some, some, uh, some arguments to overcome some of these myths. Uh, I think that, that I'd rather just engage questions as they come. So rather than just march through all of the stuff and then go back to questions, if you've got something that you want to know about or you want to follow up on some of my graphs or whatever, then just stick your hand up and I'll try and get you in, in the middle. That was, you can have my slideshow. Yes. I will make sure Kathy has it and she can send it on. Okay, let's click myth number one, carbon pricing doesn't work. Man, I hear this one a lot. And I'm gonna spend maybe my most time here because this one is, is so pervasive and, and so ubiquitous. It's everywhere, you hear this again and again. So let me be clear, carbon pricing works. Carbon pricing works for the environment, it reduces GHG emissions, and carbon pricing works for the economy, it doesn't tank the economy. Let's take a look at why, I'm gonna click through. Okay, so you're perhaps unsurprised to know that economists believe that prices affect behavior. <laughs> but, but you shouldn't be surprised by that based on your own experience as well. We respond to prices every day in all kinds of markets, in all kinds of ways. When you go to the grocery store and blueberries cost too much, maybe you buy strawberries that day. That is the way the market works, the way it sends signals, and the way we respond to it. So here's my little example. I, I looked up an Expedia vacation that I was taking hypothetically. And sure enough, there, there are price differences across these lovely choices. And I think that when you think about those choices, prices do matter. Prices do affect what you do. And carbon pricing is exactly the same. When carbon costs more to emit, we all look for ways to avoid paying that price. We look for ways to spend less. We look for cheaper alternatives. And that's exactly what carbon pricing is supposed to do. It's supposed to create that signal 
that shifts our behavior, all of our behavior, away from carbon intensive goods to less carbon intensive goods. It's not just academic and, and abstract economic theory though here. We've got real world evidence and real world data about where carbon pricing in particular has worked. The BC carbon price and the BC carbon taxes is, is the best used example, but there's a reason for that. It really is kind of the quintessential example. Uh, Nobel laureate Nordhaus in the New York Times cited the BC carbon tax uh, just, just yesterday as the example of how to do carbon pricing right. But because we've had the BC carbon tax in place since the late 2000s, we've now got lots of data and economists like our eco-fiscal commissioners can start to use that data to parse through and identify what would have happened had that carbon price not been in place. And that good rigorous statistical analysis gives us really interesting findings. Overall emissions would be five to 15% higher in BC if that carbon tax hadn't been in place. Vehicle uh, would be much less, or be 4% less efficient on average. So BC drivers are buying different cars than they would have absent that carbon price. And gasoline consumption would be much higher. So you can see that individuals and businesses have responded in BC. They have responded immediately in terms of their behavior, maybe driving less, but also in the more medium term in terms of making different investment choices, buying different cars and different equipment when it comes time to buy that new equipment. I, I, worth noting here as well, you, you, you often hear this point that, well, look, BC's emissions have actually increased sometimes during this period. Doesn't that mean that the carbon tax isn't working, that emissions are still rising? And this is a nuanced point that I wanna, I wanna make because the point is not whether they increase or decrease over time. The point is whether they increase or decrease relative to where they would have been had that policy not been put in place. What economists like to call a counterfactual, but the jargon doesn't really matter. The point is, is that you can't just look at, at levels over time because in reality, without BC's carbon tax, emissions would have been rising even more steeply than they have now. So that absolute levels is kind of a, a, mis a mistake to avoid. Uh, but you'll hear that counterpoint lots. Lots of other examples from, from all over the world, from California's cap and trade system to the UK's combination of carbon taxes and, and the European emission trading system. But one more specific example that is kind of powerful. This is one of the oldest carbon prices in the world. Sweden uh, has the, now the highest carbon price in the world, something like uh, $180 in, and maybe that's euros, I've already forgotten. Uh, but there's a great blog on EcoFiscal that you can get that actual number. Uh, but you can see that we're seeing real divergence between the growth of the economy in Sweden and the amount of emissions that Sweden's producing. And that wedge is in a big part due to carbon pricing. That high carbon price in Sweden has not crippled the economy. It's allowed the economy to continue to grow. But at the same time, those emissions have declined over time. And again, there's been enough data for good rigorous statistical analysis. And they found that in 2000, Sweden's emissions are 25% lower than they would have been without its carbon pricing policy. So again, real measurable, concrete, practical results. This isn't just theory, this is the real world. So we're thinking a little bit about the mechanisms of why and how this happens. So the way we'd like to talk about this is three timescales. In the very short term, maybe you're gonna change behavior. You're gonna, as I said for BC, you're gonna drive a little less. Maybe you will turn your furnace to, to the low setting while you're leaving for work or while you're away for vacation. And those little actions, those little changes in behavior will make more sense because of the carbon price than they would have absent it. But in the medium term, when you're buying a new furnace, when it comes time, when your, old, when your old furnace bites the dust and it's time to buy a new one, that carbon price might also cause you to think about investing in a high efficiency furnace or a super high efficient furnace rather than maybe the regular one. Maybe it'll cause you to think about an electric vehicle or a hybrid vehicle when it comes time to replace your car. Maybe when it comes time to insulate your attic, you'll go for one extra R value. Those kinds of things don't happen instantly but they really matter over time as the stock of, of existing vehicles and technologies and investments start to turn over, that's when you start to see some significant change. 
So we should be careful that we aren't judging the effects of a carbon pricing policy by only the short term because the medium term matters too. Now the longer term is the most difficult to imagine but also the most difficult to measure but maybe the most important because the other thing about carbon pricing is that it creates these incentives for innovations. It's not just giving you incentive to buy new efficient technologies. It's also giving incentives to innovators and entrepreneurs and engineers to develop the next generations of technologies that are going to reduce more GHG emissions at lower cost. And we don't know what those technologies are going to be. That's the whole point of the carbon price. We don't need to be prescriptive in assuming specific technologies and specific modes of emissions reductions in specific places. We can just set the price and let that market work its magic and drive those innovations. But I think this is where we see real bending of the curve uh, in this innovation effect. And that was really in part linking to the other half of the Nobel Prize this week, uh, Paul Romer's work on innovation as a major driver of growth. I'll click the slide, please. Okay, so this is some modeling from, from Ecofiscal's work. So running these, these big fancy economy-wide models that try to forecast the impacts of policies, including carbon prices. And this is what we projected the impacts on Canadian emissions would be from a carbon price that rises to $100 per ton by 2030. And you can see that that isn't an immediate jump to $200, per, by the way. It's a gradual ramp up slowly and steadily to not shock the economy. But you're seeing real significant emissions reductions. You're seeing that emissions trend being significantly bended down as a result of that carbon pricing policy. Uh, it doesn't quite get us to, to the target in this analysis, but it gets a lot of the way there. I, I can repeat if you want. So the, the question is, the historical emissions only go to just before 2015. Uh, a couple things here. This is a report that's a couple years old now. So a new report is coming that will do similar work. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but it also speaks to this challenge that the data is slow and that historical emissions don't show up until two or three years after the fact. Uh, so so it's, new work's still going to have this kind of lag on data. Yeah, so we didn't in this one, but it'd be a, a worthwhile modeling experiment. The, the question was, to what extent have we run different scenarios with different prices and, and maybe even accelerating that price and driving deeper reductions at higher prices? And you would see that kind of dynamic in the model, and it's those kind of things you could do. Yeah, we'll do it through the mic. It'll be easier. Uh, a two-part question. Did you include water tax adjustments? And if you did, did you include water tax adjustments for oil? No BCAs, no water cost adjustments, but hold that thought and we'll come back to competitiveness and leakage. You're getting ahead of me. Okay, let's keep marching then. Okay, myth number two. The other half of the coin, we've talked about environment outcomes. How about economic outcomes? Is this going to tank our economy? Is this going to be a disaster? Is carbon pricing one big tax grab that's nothing but costs? Not so much. Okay, so useful, I think, to step back a little bit and compare carbon pricing to what else is out there. I mean, let's set aside for the fact that there's an option out there to do nothing whatsoever and to sit on our hands and to free ride. Let's, let's just give the benefit of doubt to our opponents and assume that that is not actually what they're proposing and that they want, they do want to reduce emissions, they just want to use other policies to do so. So, Really, there's only a few options. You can use regulations, which are kind of prescriptive requirements that say sector X must achieve these specific emissions reductions at this time, or the specific levels of emissions intensity, or even adopt these specific technologies. Uh, those are, are in some ways the opposite of, of the market-driven flexibility of the carbon price because they're requiring specific things in specific times. You can also use subsidies. You could use federal or government money, whether federal, provincial, or municipal, to kind of create incentives for adoptions of clean technologies by paying the citizens to do so. Uh, again, some, some downfalls there. So, so let's work through kind of the reasons why carbon pricing costs less than all those other options, and maybe a lot less. For one, it's flexible. 
which the others are, are typically not. You can design flexible regulations, but they're never going to be as flexible as carbon pricing. So that means that to design those other policies, you're picking specific technologies. You are trying to pick winners. You're trying to say, we're going to put our money on electric vehicles as the technology. And if you're right, great. If you're not, then you wasted some of this money. You haven't allocated the best resources to the lowest cost way to reduce GHG emissions, which carbon pricing does automatically. Same thing with technology neutral. That, that, that's exactly the same point. You, you create technology neutral policy by creating flexible policy, policy that gives emitters absolutely any way to respond to that price that sees fits. It recognizes that we're not all the same, that businesses aren't all the same and individuals aren't all the same. For some, it's easy to adopt technologies because of their circumstances or, or their, their existing situation. For others, it's really hard. Carbon pricing lets those do emissions reductions that are cheap while letting those pay if it's too expensive to take those actions. And that's a feature, not a bug. That allows the lowest cost emissions reductions to happen wherever they might be. Revenue, only carbon pricing can generate revenue. Now, the point of the carbon price isn't to generate revenue, but the fact that it does generate revenue creates opportunities. Opportunities to give money back to citizens, to cut taxes, to make other investments. That's more choices that governments can use to customize their carbon pricing approach in a way that maximizes benefits. Innovation, we talked about innovation a little bit earlier, but carbon pricing is the best driver of clean innovation policy. If you wanted, if your sole objective was not to reduce GHG emissions, but simply to stimulate clean technology and clean innovation, there's great research that says carbon pricing is the best policy to do that. Regulations can get part of the way there. The more flexible they are, the more stringent they are, the more agnostic on technologies they are there, they can create some of those incentives too, but never as well as carbon pricing. Last point on free ridership. So this is the big problem with subsidies. Lots of the time when you pay people subsidies to adopt a technology, you're paying them to do something they would have done anyway or would have done at a much smaller subsidy. And that's just a waste of money. It ends up costing you more than it needs to. Question, yeah. Yeah, sure. It's, it's a tricky concept. So let me use the example of electric vehicle subsidies. So electric vehicle subsidies in Ontario before they were canceled and Quebec currently and BC as well. That pays people that buy electric vehicles something like, let's say $10,000. The number changes across provinces. So if you buy an EV, you get $10,000 back from the government. Now, for some people, that subsidy might be exactly the right switch to make them buy the, the EV. Without that subsidy, they would have done nothing. They would have bought their regular Honda Civic. Uh, but with the subsidy, they switch over and they buy a, a Bolt. But for lots of people, they would have bought the Bolt with $0 subsidies, or they would have bought it at a $2,000 subsidy because they really like the Bolt because of its performance and because of the, the driving patterns and the savings they would have got from the Bolt. And because every driver is different, you can't say exactly what this kind of universal switching point is. The switching point is different for everybody. But for everybody that would have taken less than the $10,000 to buy the, the, the car, the, the electric vehicle, you're giving them extra money. They're, they're essentially getting gravy in terms of the additional money. And that costs more from a public policy perspective than it needs to. Do you have data to support that theory? Because it's like, it, that's the reason why banks will bribe you with an iPad to switch your account because it's just too much trouble. It's so much, so much trouble for people to make that kind of a switch to think through the process and without the incentive. Intuitively, I don't have the data. It just seems to me as though free ridership wouldn't really apply as much to something like um, switching to an electric vehicle in as much as it wouldn't apply to switching all your accounts over to a bank without some kind of significant incentive to change your behavior. Yeah, there's, there's good work on this and I, I don't have it at my fingertips, uh, but, but there is academic work that quantifies that free ridership effect and it's, it's significant. It's, it's, uh, it's a significant effect. If you care only about outcomes, if you only care about the environment, then maybe you're okay. But if you care about the costs of your policies, then it's something you must consider. Question? 
In Saskatchewan, $1.5 billion was invested in carbon capture and storage. I wonder if you can comment on a government attempting to pick a winner in innovation and pouring huge resources into this rather than letting the marketplace um, go as it would. I think the fact that they are backing away from that subsidy policy speaks, speaks volumes, shall we say. It, it hasn't paid off, right? It's, it's, a, it's a bet. And it's a bet that that investment would have driven innovation and driven the cost of that policy down by learning and by experiential learning. And as a result, if they had won that bet, we'd see really cheap CCS and we'd see Saskatchewan as a leader. And that hasn't borne out. Uh, so to me, that looks like high cost abatement and a winner picker. Uh, not so much a question as an observation. At, uh, at an EV meet that I went to a couple of, about, about a month ago, I asked one of the dealers, has the lack of a subsidy affected demand? And the anecdote that he told me was that uh, of the backlog of orders that he had before the uh, subsidy was canceled in Ontario, only half of those people canceled their order. Huh, interesting, super interesting. Hi, um, I'm not sure I get the analogy with the electric vehicle. Uh, what it strikes me um, is that by picking the winners, you're giving um, a particular advantage to p particular ways of reducing carbon emissions, whereas by doing general carbon pricing, um, it's in a sense fair or it doesn't require picking the winners. No, you know, being able to understand the complexity of human behavior and what's going to work. That's what I get. I don't get how otherwise um, that's specific to the example you gave. I think we're agreeing more than disagreeing. I, I, I think that's exactly the point, that, that when you are picking specific technologies, you're ignoring the other ways to reduce GHG emissions, and you are presupposing that the one you're picking is the most important one. Uh, so I, I think we're on the same page. Okay, let's keep going for now. Okay, so a quick point that... that Carbon pricing isn't the first experiment in market-based environmental policies. There's a long history of doing this kind of thing. And there's lots of data and lots of evidence that suggests that not only has it worked, but it's been really cost-effective and that the savings relative to those regulatory approaches and those alternatives are pretty significant. Uh, this, is, this is looking back at air pollutant uh, and NOx trading, NOx trading in the U.S. And the savings in terms of costs Economists think are really large, really significant, 40 to 58% lower cost to achieve the outcomes that trading system did than it would have had they relied on a prescriptive regulatory approach. That's the kinds of economic benefits we're talking about uh, by relying on flexible mechanisms. More analysis from, my, one more click actually. Uh, more analysis here from EcoFiscal. This is one of our first carbon pricing reports and we used our modeling analysis to make that comparison, how much do the benefits of flexibility and the benefits of revenue recycling and the benefits of flexibility, not just within provinces, but between provinces, what do those benefits add up to relative to a, a prescriptive approach? And carbon pricing has a 3.7% of GDP economic benefit relative to that regulatory approach. So two, two scenarios, one, a really prescriptive regulatory approach uh, the other, a really flexible revenue generating uh, carbon pricing approach. And the, both scenarios achieve a fixed amount of emission directions, but one costs way more than the other. And 3.7% of GDP is, is a big number. That, that's like a big permanent recession. That's the kind of scale of economic benefits we're talking about here. Next. More modeling, this, this, so okay, so far we've talked about relative to policy option A versus B, and that's all very well, but how about in absolute terms? What does this mean for the cost of the economy? So here again is this $100 per ton carbon price by 2030. Here are economic growth rates in the economy, so that's the average annual growth of the economy from 2015 to 2030, under a bunch of scenarios with different revenue recycling approaches, but also with that first policy, with kind of the absence of carbon pricing. It's, it's where are we at in business as usual? Around 2.0 per 3% growth. Where does carbon pricing lower it to? 
Well, not very much. Uh, between 1.9 to 2 percent, the economy is still growing very strongly. It's growing almost as quickly as it would have without policy, albeit very slightly smaller, even though it's delivering very significant benefits in terms of reduced GHG emissions. Uh, so the scale of the impacts we're talking about here are just not large. And when you talk about, when you hear these, these kind of false narratives about the economy crashing as a result of a carbon price at 30 or $50 per ton, that's just not consistent with the evidence. This is a $100 per ton tax, and the economy is only very, very slightly slower than it would have been without that policy. Next. I'll stop briefly on here before I go. Any other quick questions? Okay, great. Okay, so somebody asked about competitiveness and leakage, so here we go. So you hear this one a lot. Uh, carbon pricing will undermine our competitiveness. Next. So the, I just clicked through these, actually. Uh, the, you hear this a lot. What about the fact that the U.S. isn't implementing policy, and that we are going to have more aggressive policy here in Canada than elsewhere, especially with our trading partners, especially with the U.S.? Does that mean that all the investment and the jobs and the production are going to just shift across the border and we're going to end up reducing our emissions at the cost of our economy because of that shift? Well, this one's a bit different than the other ones because this is a legitimate concern. You, you do care about this issue. We should care about this issue because on one hand, that's a competitiveness question. It's, it's, it's can we still attract investment and capital? On the other hand, it's also an emissions question because when production shifts to that other jurisdiction with weaker policy, those emissions are going with it. And that means that reducing emissions through leakage may reduce emissions in Canada, but it does nothing in terms of emissions globally. And maybe even it's worse if other standards are worse and it's fleeing to jurisdictions with weaker policies, uh, you may actually be adding to global emissions. So that is a win for nobody. So it's a result we must take seriously and must design our policies to handle. Fortunately, this issue, though real, is not pervasive throughout the economy. It's only a narrow set of the economy that really matters for this question. And it's really only sectors that meet two criteria. They have to be both emissions intensive, so they're producing lots of emissions uh, per unit of output. They're the things like cement or steel manufacturing, oil and gas but also things that are trading in international markets, things that you can substitute production from somewhere else with production here. And it's actually, this is more analysis from Mikko Fiskal, it's a small share of the economy that checks both those boxes. Uh, and it's only around 5% for the economy as a whole, but more like 20% in Alberta and Saskatchewan. That's a function of the oil and gas sector. So yes, it's a problem, but it's a smaller problem than some opponents might have you think it is. It's not for everybody. It's not every sector that matters. It's a few specific sectors. Next question. I got a question in the back. Thanks. Uh, at what carbon price is that, um, is that diagram um, yeah. based on? Great, great question, actually. So it's a $30 per ton in that one. But I've got a nice sensitivity analysis in this report that shows how that ratio changes at $60 or $90 or $120 per ton, because that would change the extent to which there are carbon costs that, that are rising as a share of a given sector's output. So it matters for that emissions intensity metric, that emissions cost. Uh, it, it's, it's actually not as sensitive as you think it is, because it's the sectors that are emissions exposed are very emissions exposed. So they're exposed at 30, they're really exposed at 90, but there's not that many sectors that jump across from unexposed to exposed, although there are a few. Uh, okay, next. Okay, so the, the, the key here is, yes, it's a problem, but it's only a problem for a specific sector. And most importantly of all, good policy design can solve this problem. We can have our cake and eat it too on this issue. We can design policy to manage this risk um, while also driving emissions reductions. And the key is thinking about two different problems, reducing emissions, managing competitiveness, requiring two different solutions. Uh, so first the carbon price that gives you the incentive to reduce emissions, uh, gives you that incentive for innovation, 
Next, we can also give what we call output-based allocations. And this is a fancy jargon term, but, but basically it's what the federal government is doing in its backstop. And the Alberta system does as well. It is essentially giving incentives for those exposed sectors, those emissions intensive trade exposed sectors to make more things, to keep making things. And when you combine those two incentives together, you get what we call output based pricing. And that gives these firms incentives to produce emissions by improving their performance, like investing in energy efficiency or switching to cleaner fuels or buying new technologies, but not to produce emissions by just reducing their output and shifting it to the US. So that's the sweet spot. That's the sweet spot of both of those things. Next. Yep. Is the mic on? Okay, yeah. Um, this room is full of border carbon adjustments enthusiasts. Ah. <laughs> ah. So <laughs> they, they, we, that's in our policy. So would you like to share any thoughts why the federal government chose output-based allocations, please? Yeah, and it's, it's a great question. And I, I think there's lots of appeal the border carbon adjustment, which does the same kind of thing, but doesn't take any revenue to do it, uh, and is is kind of pure in a in a intellectual sense, in that it it levels that playing field. There's a few challenges, and that's not to say we won't get there. I wouldn't be surprised if we get there eventually, but there are I would say three main challenges at least, maybe even four. One is data. It's hard to define what the emissions embedded in trading goods is. Not impossible, but hard to do. Number two, this has to be federal, not provincial, uh, because it's about trade. And when you have an uneven carbon price across the country, that is a complication for border carbon adjustments. Uh, number three, I think that it's probably WTO compliant from what I know from the lawyers I've talked to, it's probably gonna be fine. But I think that it would also get challenged. It, it would also get challenged on its first use and someone's gonna have to test it and get it through that process. Uh, and I could see lots of reasons to not introduce new uncertainty into a policy. Uh, so this, I think there's a certain pragmatism to the OBA approach, even though the, the border carbon adjustment might look better on paper. And I get pretty close to the same outcomes. Like there's good research that says you can, you can do pretty well with both of these approaches. So that leans me towards pragmatism. Question here. Um, I'm listening to you today and like you've convinced me that uh, carbon pricing is, is a good thing. Maybe I was convinced already. <laughs> shocking, <laughs> shocking. Well, finally. <laughs> um, but why do we have this huge like problem with it in Canada? Like what's our problem? <laughs> <laughs> There's a million dollar question. Yeah. You know what? Let's, let's come back to that one at the end because I think it's a bigger question. And, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to dodge it, um, but I think it's a bigger question. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more about the comparisons between um, OB I know OBA and, and um, carbon border adjustments are sort of the two leading yeah. um, approaches for leakage, but can you give us a little bit more depth? Uh, because I, off, off the page, um, CCL favors border adjustments, yeah. but I think we, we need to accept that maybe OBA is you know, sufficient yeah. and, and we could put that to bed. Yeah, uh, so the, the best academic research is from Alan Fox and Carolyn Fisher uh, out of Resources for the Future. And I can send you, uh, or you can, you can email me and I'll send you a paper if you want. Uh, but Carolyn Fisher is actually at U of O now. She just shifted to U of O and she's the, the leading academic on this question. Uh, so she's around. Uh, but, but her research says that they, they can essentially get similar outcomes at similar costs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, someone wants to know what, OB, what does OBA stand for? So OBA is Output-Based Allocation. And that's a really jargony way of saying a subsidy for production or output, for making stuff. The more stuff you make, the more emissions you get for free in these carbon pricing systems. And that's a de facto subsidy for production. I think I've heard that um, some skepticism in, in the media that uh, this is just the big government um, repaying favors to its favored industries. Uh -huh. Yeah, let's see. So I, I think really important 
to, to differentiate output-based allocations or output-based pricing from exemptions. The alternative, and in one industry would like, by the way, is to just be excluded from the system altogether and to not, have, not be part of the system and therefore be sheltered via that exemption. And that's a, a much worse way to solve this problem because it solves the leakage problem at the cost of the incentive to improve their performance. Because under this system, even if their total costs are gonna be lower, uh, then they're still gonna have incentive to reduce that extra emission reduction. It's still always gonna be worth 20, 30, $40 per ton to reduce an emission. That's an important incentive. Now, the other side of that, because it's still a fair question, I would think it's fair to say that historically governments have given out more output-based allocations than really necessary to address this, this leakage question, this competitiveness question. And that's equally true in cap and trade systems where free allocations do some of the similar things. And we're seeing kind of this political pull towards more OBAs and more allocations than truly necessary to address that narrow targeted problem. And that is, I'm afraid, politics and the lobbying processes. But, but, much better to have that debate and that lobbying focused on how many free allocations they get while maintaining that price incentive than lobbying over the level of the price or the level of the regulation in a regulatory world. At least we're shifting this, this debate to a place that doesn't undermine the effectiveness of policy in the same way. Uh, so uh, another question on the same, uh, uh, same theme. Um, I've heard that uh, output pace <coughs> allocations kind of are keeping things in a way as business as usual as far as it won't allow for the sort of transformative innovations to occur. And kind of similar also to what you were saying about the free riders, it's, it's kind of keeping the technologies similar, it's just making them more efficient. I'd say less, more on the first and less on the second. I think that, it, that you're right in that it doesn't give in firms, firms, let's say in cement or oil and gas, to shut down a facility or to not build a refinery. And a pure carbon price, a pure carbon tax with no output-based allocations might do that. It might cause a firm not to build that new refinery or to not to build that new plant. It's, it's the big lumpy investments, not just about a little bit more from their existing facilities, but a whole new facility. And, and you're, you're right, that, that takes that incentive away to, to reduce emissions by not building new things. And in some cases, maybe that new thing shouldn't be built, but it's, it's really hard to separate those new buildings that shouldn't be built because of efficiencies and because of the shifts in this global economy versus this leakage risk, that that thing is actually gonna just be built somewhere else instead. So there's a cost there, and I think it, that that's right to point out, but it's a necessary evil until we have kind of consistent global carbon pricing where we don't have to worry about this problem. Um, uh, you sort of answered my question in terms of the potential for abuse in OBA systems. Um, I wonder if you could just make a quick comment in comparing Alberta's OBA and the recently announced Saskatchewan. The Saskatchewan system accomplishes almost nothing for emissions reduction. They're hiding a lot of industry in there and it's very disappointing. Uh, and so it, to me, it's an example of an opportunity to kind of hide things and exclude them from effective carbon pricing. Uh, is that valid? I think not quite. I think that the big missing piece from the Saskatchewan policy is what's the price of carbon going to be? What's the, the price of those tradable permits? And if the price is large, then I'm not so worried about the generous emissions intensity benchmarks. Now we're, we're late on time, so I'm, okay, all right. So we're gonna have to kind of maybe skip a little bit. You guys are just too keen on stuff. Uh, so I'm gonna try and go faster. So let's, let's clip. So carbon pricing is regressive. Is carbon pricing unfair for households? Click. Uh, this is essentially a graph that shows burden on low income households on the left to high income households on the right based on the share of their income. And you can see that that slope down implies this might not be fair on its own. A carbon price might not be fair for low income households. And I'll click again to keep myself moving. But again, a legitimate problem with a real solution. Even only 10 to 12 to 13% of revenue used as dividends to household would solve that problem. 
And if we use much more than that, then we can make this a progressive policy rather than a regressive policy. Click. Uh, Alberta's doing exactly this. Alberta has sent lots of, lots of households checks. About 60% 60, 60 of households get uh, checks and it's a progressive policy as a result. Onwards. Okay, this is an important one. Revenue recycling undermines the price signal. So by giving money back with one hand, what we take from the other, does that mean we have nothing? Click. Uh, basically, no, that you can save money by avoiding emissions, and that incentive to do so exists whether or not you're getting it, uh, because you're already getting a dividend. So my two household examples here, both of them get that dividend on the bottom, so they get this money in the mail, the check in the mail, for example. And whatever they save in terms of avoided emissions reductions, uh, avoided emissions, I should say, and avoiding the carbon price, is additional savings on top of that dividend check. Click. Okay, last one, I'm actually gonna make it in time, wow. Okay, is carbon pricing a job killer? Is, we certainly heard this a lot, haven't we? Uh, and the evidence says no, not at all. Next slide. Uh, good, good analysis here. Uh, and basically we are not seeing in BC or other jurisdictions uh, that there has been a net loss in jobs. It's been this shift, yes, from emissions intensive sectors to not emissions intensive sectors, but that, that net impact has been small. And in, in BC, it was even small, but positive. Uh, it, I, it might be, it might be, I can't remember. Yeah. In, impressive, by the way. <laughs> Cor correcting my citations is, is bonus points in this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, um, I think I'm almost done. Next. Okay, so let me wrap up with one last slide. Yes, carbon pricing works. Incentives do matter. Demand curves do slope down, in the words of economists. Uh, this is the lowest cost way to reduce GHG emissions. We can and should design policy to address concerns around competitiveness. We can and should design policy to manage household fairness questions. Uh, good revenue recycling is absolutely part of the story, and there's more than one way to do that, uh, including dividends to households. And overall, this is a policy that makes sense. It can support a growing, prosperous economy while also reducing emissions over time. And we barely made it. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs>